All right, welcome. We are here in Boca Raton, Florida, on the East Coast, and we are happy to be with Laura Powell. And um, we're going to be talking about Islam today, and uh, as well as some other things. But she uh, is an expert in Islam. We're here at the Women in Apologetics Conference, and uh, super excited to be here. Most of the interview Elizabeth is going to be conducting, um, and I have a few questions as well. So uh, let's get into it. Hey, so Laura, what got you into apologetics? Well, I actually didn't become a Christian until I was 21 years old. Oh, okay. um, I wasn't raised in a Christian home, and so it was something that I had to be convinced of, uh -huh. not something that I grew up just, you know, thinking was true, being told it was true. And so um, I actually became a Christian my senior year in uh, college. Okay. And it was a very, very hostile environment toward Christianity and Christians. And so there was a price to pay um, for being a Christian. And in fact, um, I, I got, uh, I had, I had gotten A's on all my papers my whole life, any sort of paper I had written, and um, including in college. And then my, my senior year, suddenly I'm a Christian. I write a paper uh, defending the um, one aspect of the Christian faith, and I got a D. Wow. And my professor told me the reason um, I got a D is because no thinking person can believe this nonsense wow. in this day and age. It's very open-minded. So <laughs> right, right. So tolerant. <laughs> So, um, uh, I, um, so I actually took a few courses in the Divinity School okay. um, at Duke University and learned all the reasons why um, the Bible is supposedly a bunch of contradictions and a big mess uh, at, and the at the Divinity School and why um, it, it just can't be trusted as a guide for your life or anything like that. But it is very useful for teaching us myths about um, you know old people from ancient times before we knew anything about science okay. so um, but I became through reading the scriptures I became a Christian and um, I went to Denver Seminary uh, a few years later and just was so hungry to learn absolutely everything I loved theology I loved church history I loved um, New Testament Old Testament every single course I was taking I just wanted more and more and um, uh, one of my professors was uh, Craig Blomberg, who okay. is just phenomenal. And he incorporated into our New Testament courses apologetics all, all the time. And so um, uh, I learned a lot of apologetics from him. And several years later, I, so I, I was in ministry for, um, uh, I've been in ministry most of my life, adult life, since becoming a Christian. And um, uh, Several years later, I was working at a church, and the minister, an ordained minister, um, was using his position to try to lead people away from Christ in the church. He was trying to convince people Christianity was not true. And I, um, uh, so I would engage with him in his, you know, attacks on, on the faith. And... Uh, uh, I was mostly in a defensive position, you know, right. he would attack in this area and I would say, oh, well, we sure. can explain that this way. Yeah. And um, and then I read, um, I read uh, what's it called, The Case for the, for the, Rex Res for the Resurrection of Jesus mm -hmm. by uh, Mike Lacona and Gary Habermas. And I thought, wow, this is, I, I haven't heard this, this argument before. I'm going to see how this works. You know, so I, um, I went in and made this case to, to this pastor. And he was just at a loss for words. So you went on the offensive. Yeah, I went Yay. on the offensive. And, he, and I said, well, how, so, but how do you explain these minimal facts? What do you think happened? He goes, something happened. And I said, well, yeah, of course something happened. But yeah. what do you think happened? He's yeah. like, well, fortunately, unlike you, I don't feel like I have to know all the answers. And, and he I, works and, in the Yeah, exactly. And I said, well, <laughs> I said, well, if... if if there's only one question yeah. that we that that we should need to know the answer to, if there's any chance that Jesus was who he claimed to be and who yes. history shows him to have been, if there's any chance he, that there really was a resurrection, this seems to be the one question we would want to know the yeah, answer absolutely. to and seek um, all we can. And uh, and he kind of thought for a second. He was trying to think of something witty, you know. And he goes get out of my office go get get out of my office and I'm laughing it was hilarious I thought it was hilarious and he and he goes and shut the door behind you <laughs> so um, 
I that was fun. It was really really fun to have you know to be able to uh, you know to to see other people cowering and saying, right. yeah, I don't really believe this. I'm just here for the good music, you know, sure. which I still find hard to believe. But um, <laughs> depends on what you're doing, I'm sure. But uh, and then to to be able to say, no, you know what? I'm proud of my beliefs because. Um, I'm not ashamed, you know, like Paul said, Be, um, there are reasons yeah. for believing. This is not some ridiculous myth. This is yeah. not like believing in Santa Claus at, you know, in, at age 35 or whatever. Yeah. And so um, around the same time I started ministering in a Muslim community and I had read um, Seeking Allah, Finding Jesus uh, by uh, Nabil Qureshi, yes. Um, I had been ministering to Muslims for years and I had read the Quran. I had, um, you read the Quran? Yeah. Good for yeah, you. Yeah, challenging yeah. <laughs> to get through, but um, I, I was familiar with the Hadith, and um, I had been to several Muslim majority countries and ministered there, and so I um, I had that experience. But uh, but uh, during this time, I was seeing the, the value and, um, and the usefulness of apologetics. I read his book and then his second book, and um, was ministering them in the um, refugee community, and. I was just seeing how fun it was to have conversations with Muslims who I was becoming really close to, who I just loved, who were like family to me. Um, they kind of adopted me, you know, as, as a part of their family, and I just loved them. I taught all the kids how to read and um, uh, taught them English and history and math, and so we would have a ton of fun together, but every, almost every day, definitely every week. Uh, conversations would come up about you know why do Muslims do this or why you know they would ask me Miss Laura why can't girls ride horses um, in the Muslim world why and they can in the US why this why that you know they would ask me a lot of questions so I was seeing the value of being able to answer people's questions and and just having so much fun with it so I continued studying apologetics um, went uh, you know beyond what I had learned in seminary um, because I, I realized there was so much more and um, it just really kind of went from there that's how I got involved in apologetics that's awesome so you mentioned being involved in the Muslim world and in apologetics with Islam so yes. what have you found are the biggest differences between Christianity and Islam right um, yeah. yeah there are a lot of differences so on the surface they, they seem to the person who doesn't dig very deeply that um, they may be very, very similar. They're not very similar. We, we would both say that we believe in one God, but we mean different things by that. We would both say we believe in Jesus, but we have completely different understandings of who he, who he is and was. Um, we say, you know, we believe in angels and demons and heaven and hell. And um, yet when you go just, you know, a centimeter deep, you find that the, the, the differences span all of our uh, doctrines, beliefs and such. So, uh, for example, with um, our understanding of God, uh, we, um, God has revealed himself in the Bible, in the New Testament, um, as Father and um, as a Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And in Islam, this is completely offensive. And um, Muslims believe that God is in no way, in no sense, a father. I was initially told when I first started studying Islam years and years ago that it was just because they have a misunderstanding, that they think that God had sex with Mary and produced a son, and that's why it's offensive. And I think that uh, that that understanding, that misunderstanding, is widespread. But when I have cleared that up with people, they with Muslims, they still are very upset and offended about God being a, a father in any way, shape, or form. I'll, they'll even agree. You know, I'll, I'll I'll talk about other metaphors in the Bible, like that that God is that uh, you know. Um, God is uh, like a door, or you know things like this that sure. you would think they'd be like, oh yeah, that I mean that's clearly yeah uh, like a metaphor, or whatever. They'll be they'll be like, um, oh yeah, yeah. Well, I can agree God's a door. I can agree God's like a hen. I can agree God's. Sure. Like, and I said, well, so can you? Would you agree that God is at least like a father? And they're like, no, no, no way. He's not like a father in any way, shape, or form. So even just purely as a metaphor, it's they, my Muslim friends have found it really upsetting. And, um, and, yeah, so 
It's uh, too relational for them. Like, yeah, yeah, exactly. So, so in the Quran, God is revealed as a slave master, okay. and people are his slaves, and not, um, yeah, he's he he rules things. Um, people serve him; they just do whatever he asks. His commands are not rooted in his character, as in the Bible. You know, with the Bible, we when we learn God's commands, this tells us something about his character. Um, whereas in Islam, God's commands are just an outworking of his power. He's just saying, I have the authority to tell you to do this, so you're going to do it because I say so. It doesn't tell you anything about me. Um, you can't know me. You're such a little peon. You cannot know me. Just do what I tell you. And that's, you know, that's that. And so, uh, so, I mean, that's another difference, you know, is that God's commands being rooted in his holiness, his character versus just pure power. Um, another difference, just with regard to God, would be um, that um, that the God of the Bible has um, sent, um, you know, the Father sent the Son to the earth, and the Son came willingly to the earth and, and took on flesh and lived as a man, experienced temptation in every way as a man, and yet was without sin in order to take on um, our sins and die on our behalf and pay the penalty due for our sin um, and then offer to exchange um, his righteousness for our sin. Just the greatest news imaginable. <laughs> and um, this is completely rejected in Islam. Um, God um, is someone who would never suffer for another in Islam. That is beneath him, below him offensive, he wouldn't do it. Uh, what about yeah. salvation? Yeah, so salvation. So, yeah, I think the biggest difference would be that um, we believe, of course, that Jesus is deity. He he died by crucifixion and he rose from the dead. That is all rejected in Islam. And so that, that I would say, is the very biggest difference. Because right there, that's the gospel. That's the good news. That's, yeah. you know, what we... Um, uh, that's the, the means by which we're able to do, become a part of God's family. And Muslims reject that. The Quran rejects that. So um, salvation in Christianity, of course, is uh, by faith, um, through, by, by grace through faith. And in Islam, it's by works. Your works are always being weighed and measured. And um, God is also quite whimsical and moody in Islam. And so even if you do a pretty good job, even like Muhammad, um, he's the pattern of conduct, the excellent pattern for conduct in Islam. I know that's scary. Um, but even he, according to the Quran uh, or the, the Hadith, did not know whether or not he was saved ever until the end, like he never knew. So um, you, you can work and work and work but you just cannot know, you cannot have that certainty um, that God has adopted you into his family, that he's paid the, the, the price for your penalty, and that you are his. Yeah, so. seems like that's a lack of assurance, is a lack of peace. Yeah, exactly. So, and that's just with the, yeah. the doctrine of God and, and Jesus. There, I mean, there are several others. I will randomly come into a store and see a woman dressed as the you know, yeah, mm -hmm. traditional gear. Mm -hmm. um, but you seem like you have a lot of stories about your Muslim friends and you've gone to Muslim countries. Do you have a lot of Muslim friends here or mostly abroad? Like, where do you come in contact with all these people? Yeah, that's a great question. Both, actually. Um, I have, like I mentioned, I've been to a lot of um, Muslim majority countries mm -hmm. and I've um, made friends there by, for example, um, I, I volunteered to teach English at a, um, a community center with a school for girls in Afghanistan. Oh. And so I, I have some Muslim friends from there. Um, the, uh, through the people I went with to Afghanistan, they introduced me to some other um, uh, family members they have in the U.S. And so oh, okay. I have um, uh, friends through my experiences in Afghanistan in the U.S., but I also have friends uh, who are Muslims in the U.S. from um, volunteering in the um, refugee community in okay. Clarkston, Georgia. Okay. And I met a lot of Muslims there, and that's where 
uh, this one particular family I mentioned that I taught the kids, you know, who they're like family to me and I just adore them. Uh, they, uh, that's where I met them. And so um, I will also uh, just go up to people, you know, when I see them wearing, uh, you know, a headscarf or a job or something and, and ask them, um, uh, hey, where are you from? And I think, you know, I don't, I can't quite keep up with what in the U.S. is offensive and not offensive. Sure. <laughs> um, because we, we seem to be, uh, everything seems to be offensive these days. Right. But, but when people are from other countries and Muslim majority countries, especially in my experience, they, the women love when someone comes up and says hi and just asks any random question. Oh. Like, where are you from? Oh, I like your dress. Um, you know, where, where's that from? And where are you from? And how long have you been here? And um, uh, what, how has your experience been like? And, you know, what's it like to be away from home? You know, I think a lot of Americans assume that um, everybody must just be thrilled purely thrilled um, to be here with and just purely happy to be away from their home country and while they are usually thrilled to be here that doesn't mean they don't miss um, their you know parts of their culture their family their yeah. food and so to meet somebody even though they're happy to be here to meet somebody who can understand like oh is it hard to be away from home from what you grew up with from where you knew every like everyone yeah. and everything and how to do everything and, yeah. and, and everyone dressed like you yes yeah, exactly like, yeah. right exactly they um, they tend to uh, the women I've met tend to really appreciate that that's how I've met some others um, I met one uh, woman at a a cooking class that um, I was there to learn, not teach. <laughs> but she sat next to me, and um, she had just come to the U.S. from Afghanistan. Okay. And so um, I told her, you know, her uh, her English was okay at best at the time, but she understood that I have been to Afghanistan. When I told her, and I showed her some pictures just so she could like really make sure to make sure she understood. Yeah. So. Um, uh, yeah, just just being willing to, I think it's really important to be willing to kind of forget about ourselves and what how people are going to perceive us. It doesn't really matter. Let's say, you know, let's say most of the people I went up to thought, wow, what a weirdo, what a freak. <laughs> like, who cares? I, I, that's not where I find my identity. Um, yeah. But that's not been my experience at all. My experience has been a tremendous uh, gratefulness. I also volunteered to teach English at the library in one of the cities I've lived in okay. uh, for a few years and I met several um, Muslim women there who okay. then invited me over to their home. I invited their, them to my home and we had, we, you know, created a, a lifelong friendship. That's so, awesome. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. Yep. How do you get to a point in a conversation where everything is just really shallow, has life, has the weather, moving to, like, how do you initiate do you know who Jesus is? <laughs> right. Like, yeah, I know Jesus the prophet. You know, <laughs> right. How do you move from like shallow conversation to a deeper conversation, introducing your beliefs into right. the conversation without like it's just very intimidating because you're like, oh, these people obviously if they're dressed in the traditional wear, then they have deep seated beliefs. I, you know, don't want to be offensive, but I want them to be with the Lord. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think, again, that is, um, I totally relate to that, but that's a very much a product of the American culture. Okay. So um, what I discovered when I went overseas was that um, Muslims really just about everywhere. I've been, I've been to about 30 countries, um, mostly um developing nations that like not really places people go for vacation <laughs> but um pe where people go to you know to minister and what i found is that th that's like the first thing people want to talk to with, uh, with me and so you know they'll they'll ask me my name and sometimes the the second or third question will be are you a christian what do you believe interesting and yeah and so not small talk right exactly yeah and so uh they'll uh, you know they, they seem very com in my experience uh, uh people outside of the west are very very comfortable talking about their spiritual beliefs their political beliefs huh. the things that kind of we've been taught are taboo sure. or you know just try to avoid that yeah. um that's what my friends want to talk about them from other countries and 
um, this this one family, um, and this is this has happened with with so many families. But I, the, the one family I mentioned earlier, who I, I taught the kids, they would I would uh, teach their kids for like six uh, five six hours until dinner time, and then they would usually convince me to stay for dinner, um, and they would invite extended family members over, and these extended family members, especially the men. Um, would uh, who had been exposed to a, um, a Western culture quite a bit, so they were comfortable with men having a conversation with a woman. That's not something you can assume in the Muslim world. There's a huge separation between the genders. But in the U.S., the, um, these men would come over and they would just start debating me. They're like, so you're a Christian, huh? Well, well, if God is three and God is one, that's a contradiction. So Christianity is wrong. And like we, we would just start, you know, debating, and I would explain sure. that, and then I, sure. you know, I would, I would uh, raise how they. The, they have similar issues with their belief of God as ab, an absolute oneness, and you know, and well, if the Quran is eternal and your absolute one God is eternal, then um, they can't both be eternal and yet both be the only one eternal thing. So you've got a problem too. I I can explain that with the Trinity. God is one, but one being, but He is three persons. It's not a contradiction because a being is not a person. And so um, we'll just, you know, we'll, we'll have debates about that all, like, for hours. And then, you know, I'm like, okay, you guys, I love this. This is awesome. I need to go to bed, though. So they'll, they'll be like, okay, tomorrow date, dinner, wow. dinner and debate. That's great. <laughs> and so it's just a lot of fun. And the kids would listen and laugh and be entertained. And, yeah. I mean, there were times, like, we'd be kind of, I mean, it's hard to explain, but kind of respectfully, like, but passionately loudly de sure. like defending our beliefs and and uh, you know how do you answer that and then time's up and we're like good to see you okay see you tomorrow night that was fun That's so awesome. it's um, yeah I think uh, I, I really actually think that it's it's sad that wh whoever has convinced us that we can't talk about those things and still be close and care about each other I mean I know that that family would lay down their lives for me and and vice versa and so, you know, even though we, we disagree on our most um, sacred, um, valuable uh, beliefs, and so uh, it's yeah, it's it's a lot of fun. I would I would say we um, yeah, I, w I wish we I hope that you know we can um, start to overcome this whole concern about um, what are, what are people going to think about me and and um, and getting offended so easily. It just doesn't have to be that way. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. So in your experience in witnessing to Muslims, mm -hmm. have you found that there's maybe a few things that prevent people from coming to Christianity? Or is it just depends on the person? Mm -hmm. Or is there like mostly just leaving their culture or their families, what they would think about it? Yeah, so I think I, in my experience, the biggest reasons people don't leave Islam um, are fear and complacency. Okay. So they, um, from birth, um, they are declared to be Muslims and they're, they're raised to um, believe that their entire identity, all of their value and their worth, who they are, what they do, and everything about them is completely wrapped up in Islam. Okay. And so, um, and, and, and in their family. But the family is also wrapped up in Islam. <laughs> and so the, um, the community, the family, um, the beliefs, the, the opportunities that you'll have in life, the way people think about you, all of that is tied to Islam. And so um, really I, um, what I've found is that um, people have to have a genuine openness to finding the truth. Okay. If they, um, and most Muslims are um, do believe there is truth, that truth exists. It's not just my truth or your truth, um, but uh, they've been taught in hundreds, thousands of different ways from the time they were born to the present that um, that Islam is the truth. Sure. And, yeah. Uh, and that if they question it, if they doubt it, um, they will be separated from God. Wow. They will go to hell. And so there's no option to make sure it's true. You just have right. to believe that it's true. Or exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So doubting and seeking um, to have your questions answered is highly discouraged, both culturally and in the Quran. Huh. The Quran says that um, when you're when you're told something with regard to Islam, 
your response is just to say yes and obey. That's it. You, you cannot have any doubt. You cannot. No, um, come let us reason together. Yeah, none of that. None right. of that. <laughs> okay. Wow. Right. So, when you do see people move from Islam to Christianity, is there a similarity in why they move, or it's just they're just more open to seeing the truth no matter where it leads them? Yeah, I think, well, I, I do think that uh, and the only the only time I've seen um, this has happened a lot. But the, the, in all of the times that I've seen people, uh, Muslims become Christians, it's been because they have been completely convinced that Christianity is the truth and that Islam is false. Okay. Both of those things. So even if um, even if I convince my Muslim friends that Christianity um, has a ton of evidence that it's um, you know, Nabil Qureshi, for example, had said um, that that after hearing um, Mike Lacona debate, uh, I think it was Shabir Ali, um, he was convinced that um, the resurrection happened and that Christianity was 99% true. There, there was he was 99% certain it was true, but that he was 100% certain that Islam was true. That's what he had been, you know, sure. raised with and taught from birth, and so. It wasn't until, it wasn't enough just to convince him that Christianity was true. He also had to be convinced that Islam was not true. And I've seen that as well. I've had uh, some of my Muslim friends have asked me, they've said, um, so, you know, you've convinced me actually that Christianity is true, but I've decided I want to be a Muslim and a Christian. And I'm like, no, <laughs> that's not how it works. So you can be Persian and a Christian. Yeah. You can be Arab and a Christian, uh, yeah. but you cannot be a Muslim and a Christian. And they're like, why not? But I think Christianity is true, but I have to be a Muslim. You don't understand. I have to. Like, my family is Muslim. My dad will kill me if, if I'm not a Muslim. Like, this, my whole life will be over if I'm not a Muslim. But I know Christianity is true. And I'll tell them, well, you have a very difficult decision to make then. Do you want to follow the truth um, and go you know, in, in the direction of truth and goodness and beauty um, now and for all eternity and be with God? Or um, do you want to, and you can avoid the temporary hardship of disappointing your family, or you can stick with your family and have it have a little bit easier path now, um, probably, you know, throughout the rest of this life, and a much, much difficult, uh, more difficult eternity. Um, I understand, like, I, I mean, I really don't understand, <laughs> to be honest, um, but I, you know, I, I'll tell them, I, I, I know, I, like, I, yeah, to put myself in your position, I can't say that I, you know, that I've done that, um, but, but I can tell you it's worth it. It's absolutely worth it. Um, I wasn't raised in a Christian home either, and, um, uh, and I did not have um, Christian friends in college during that time, and I paid a price for making that decision, not um, not the price of my life, of course, which many Muslims do have to um, sacrifice. They, you know, they're often killed by their family members for becoming Christians. Um, so I can't, you know, pretend to know what that's like. Right. But I do know um, I, I've experienced pretty much everything this world, this life, has to offer. Um, my parents had a lot of money. I had an amazing education. I've had amazing friends. Um, I've lived in amazing places. I've traveled all over the world. I've experienced what this world has to offer. And every day I think about how I can't wait to be with Jesus. Um, not in a suicidal way, <laughs> but in a, if God, if you're ready, let today be the day. Let, that, that's good with me. Um, and it, it's just, it's infinitely better. It's indescribably better. And. Uh, and so, I'm, I still I'm convinced that you know, as hard as it is, it's it's the right decision and the best decision. Yeah. And I've heard this from many Muslims who have made that decision, who have said, "Yeah, I lost everything. My family, they don't speak to me anymore. Uh, my my community is gone. Yeah. Um, my all my job opportunities were lost. Um, my whole identity was lost. But I'm a daughter of the King, and it's worth it. I'll take it. I'll do it any day again." So, yeah. And of course, God's gonna reward those people. Mm -hmm. right? Yes, but absolutely. in this life and yes. in the one to come. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah, and they, they share that too. I mean, yeah. just what a privilege it is yeah. to um, to be a part of what God's doing in this world and how He yeah. takes care of them and how um, they see His hand on their lives. 
um, and uh, and in a lot of cases brings family members to himself as well. Yeah. So that's so awesome. Yeah. So you have a lot of experience with my son. Mm -hmm. You have a course. Yes. With that, correct. Can you yes. tell me about that? Yeah. So it's um, the course is called Islam Foundations. Okay. I created it through um, and with Women in Apologetics. We had a really neat team working together um, with videography, and uh, I, I went out to California to uh, film that with um, uh, Robert Lontrager, um, uh, who is uh, the videographer for um, All the Things um, with Krista Lontrager and Monique Dusan, and um, uh, he's done a lot of other work. So, uh, and we had some great. Uh, uh, some people who put together some you know, the graphics and all of that, but uh, so it's a, it's a, um, it's information that I had been teaching in my local church and in some other churches in my area um, for several years. Um, I kind of refined it a little bit to be an online course and okay. we recorded it. But there are 20 lessons. Every lesson is about 20 minutes on average long. Uh, some are the one of them is like 10, some are 30 but about 20 minutes each, but very, very dense. So okay. um, I recommend people take notes and stop it regularly and think about it and rewatch it. Sure. But um, uh, it's really, um, I, I don't think there's anything quite like it out there. I was unable to find anything like it, which is why I thought it was such a worthwhile endeavor mm -hmm. um, because we uh, present a, um, a very uh, comprehensive, um, understanding of Islam what based on the Islamic sources okay. it's not my opinion or you know I'm reading this and this is how I'm going to interpret it we, we put the Quran verses um, on a graphic and put it up on the screen we quote the hadith in, in the same way and so using the Muslim sources um, uh, we show what they believe what the problems are with these beliefs um, what questions Muslims are likely to ask Christians to challenge Christianity and how to um, how to defend Christianity with truth and um, all it's all presented from a place of um, of compassion as well you know I am not just trying to attack Muslims like I've said I you know I love um, my Muslim friends and family and um, so it's available through the Women in Apologetics website, womeninapologetics.com. And um, uh, now let's see, the, there are also several, I think maybe eight guest interviews. I interviewed Al Fadi, um, uh, George Saig, uh, uh, former Muslims, missionaries to Muslims, people who have worked all over the world, uh, people. Uh, from all different backgrounds and situations, so so you get to hear, you know, from former Muslims. You get to hear from uh, people who are academics. So one of the men I interviewed has something like six PhDs in, in that. <laughs> good <for him. laughs> right? So um, so yeah, just from all different backgrounds. Um, and then I teach the the material itself. Those twenty lessons. The interviews with other experts are bonuses um, that come along with the course. But the course itself. Uh, is uh, uh, 20 lessons on all different topics. That's awesome. So what age range do you recommend that course for? Yeah, uh, great question. I um, High school and older for sure. Okay. We have had um, an 81 year old or 83 year old take That's the course awesome. and she said she loved it. That's she, great. Yeah, so I just love that. It's so great. And I know that we had um, our youngest, uh, I think, who I know about who's taken it was 18. Okay. So um, certainly high school and up. Okay. But I would think, um, uh, depending on their individual ability, um, uh, middle schoolers, I would think, could get something out of it as well. Okay. So. That's good. So yeah. do you recommend this for individual study or for Bible studies at church or somewhere yeah. in between? Yeah. Um, we, let's see. Uh, all of those so right now whether you want to take it individually or go through it with your your spouse or your best friend or your small group or your church um, there's one there's only one option available you can uh, purchase the course and go through it with whomever you want okay. um, but we are working on putting together a group um, like a study guide it, okay. there is an individual study guide already so that I, that's um, going to be really helpful whoever you go through it with 
but we're putting together a group study guide in particular, and I think we're going to have two different options in the future so that um, uh, there will be a little bit higher cost if you're going to go through it with a group. And, um, you know, uh, so, uh, but you'll get, you'll, you know, you'll get a little bit of extra, um, some extra materials that will be helpful in a group as well. That's great. So, that's great. Yeah. So that's exciting because you know so much about Islam, and I feel like the majority of people, at least that I know, in America, we don't have a lot of contact right. with people in Islam, mm -hmm. and it's kind of intimidating when you don't know. Right. But it's always good to be humble mm -hmm. and willing to learn, so that you can be prepared that when you do meet someone who's a Muslim, you'd be like, "I know what to yes. say." Yes, exactly. <laughs> because that's definitely a confidence booster. Of course, we already have the Holy Spirit who's mm -hmm. going to be with us and empowering us right. to have those conversations. But it's always great to have that knowledge. Yeah, so, that's yeah, awesome. it really is. Yeah, yeah, it, it's opened up the world to me. You know, to to know. Um, so much now about Islam uh -huh. and, and um, you know the first several conversations were just kind of a uh, um, they were scary you know <laughs> and, uh, to initiate a conversation with someone who looks really different and uh, especially with the covering and everything I think that can be really intimidating Definitely. to Americans but yeah it has been so worth it and the, the Muslims I've met have just so immediately put me at ease um, I remember yeah, being in Afghanistan and being really concerned with not offending anyone or upsetting uh -huh. anyone. And so I would ask my translator questions constantly. And after a few questions, she's like, let me just let me just lay it down for you. You can do whatever you want. It's fine. It's fine. Just do whatever you want. <laughs> and, and of course, she didn't mean that. Like, literally, she didn't. I had to have my head covered in Afghanistan. She didn't mean just take off your, you know, clothes and start prancing Shit. around Shit, yeah. <laughs> but you know I was like do I drink, drink my tea this way do I put it in here uh, do I do I sit down this way what's the right way to sit down and okay. <laughs> just do whatever you want <laughs> yeah. so yeah so they know you're foreign anyway yeah like, they're, they're, yeah they're like you know everyone's kind of look at you and go she doesn't she's not from around here <laughs> yeah that's awesome <laughs> yeah All right, so uh, are a lot of Muslims aware of the blunders of uh, Muhammad and, you know, the different atrocities that were commit that he committed? Um, are they aware of those things? And if not, do you think that would affect um, their personal belief in Islam at all? Yeah, most of them, in my experience, are not. Um, there, I think in it depends on where they are um, and how much they've studied the Quran and the Hadith. That that makes a huge difference. So, like in Pakistan, for example, uh, Muslims are a lot more likely to have read the Quran and to have um, to know about the the Hadith, which records the words and the actions of Muhammad, the, the traditions of Muhammad, and. Uh, uh, but here in the U.S., the Muslims I've met, even from other countries, the ones who have wanted to come to the U.S., have generally not been aware of the different types of um, behaviors of Muhammad. They're not aware, for example, that um, he um, married a six-year-old girl, that he consummated the marriage when she was nine years old, that he um, uh, went on the offensive to attack communities um, to take them over, that, that Islam was spread primarily um, in large part by the sword, um, that, um, you know, that they don't know things like, you know, that he caused the, the divorce of his adopted son and uh, his wife and then um, took that woman for himself. And, and um, they're not generally aware of all the sex slaves he had and all the um, that he instituted prostitution essentially as a normal um, and accepted way of life for Muslims. So a lot of these different things that um, and there are there are a lot more. Uh, but um, uh, in my experience, most Muslims don't know these things. And when I share them with them, they will tell me. I haven't heard that anywhere, and I'm a Muslim, and um, I've been talking to other Americans too, and other Christians, and they they never raise these things. So I think this is just your misunderstanding. This is your interpretation. 
And I really think that is a problem. I think that that is that that Christians need to be aware of um, what kind of person Muhammad was, and they need to not be afraid to share this at the right time and place, of course, with their Muslim friends to bring it up and. Um, um, not in an attacking way, but just, you know, so how do you, yeah, I asked my, uh, some friends of mine, so, you know, um, what do you think about Muhammad, you know, consummating marriage with a nine-year-old? I mean, that, that, that's really unusual and, and not accepted at all in the U.S. So, like, what, um, and, you know, Christians would say that that's just wrong. Yeah. So, um. Uh, you know, do you find that offensive, or do you are you okay with that? You think, things like that. Um, I think it's important to find a way to bring these things up because Muslims care what the people around them think. Um, most Muslims get their beliefs from their community more than from the Quran and the Hadith. There are many reasons for that that I talk about in my Islam course, online course. Um, there are a lot of barriers to understanding the Quran and the Hadith, but. Um, when Muslims think it's just my opinion or it's just my issue or my misunderstanding, they're not, they don't really look into it. They've told me I'm not going to look into that. You're the only one who's ever mentioned that to me. But if, if it were a regular thing that people were, you know, when, when Muslims were coming up and, you know, to us and saying, hey, I mean, this happens to me where Muslims come up and say, you're a Christian, but you need to be a Muslim because our Quran is uncorrupted. It's, and your Bible is corrupted. I mean, there are a lot of different ways to respond to that. But if we were willing to say, hey, look, I'm not going to follow a pedophile. I'm not going to follow um, someone who, like, you know, a murderer. Um, someone who, who lived the way Muhammad lived, that it's unacceptable, I think it's hateful, it's disgusting. Um, that sounds really harsh and rude to Christians. Like we're so, I think we've been so trained to just be nice, even though I really don't think this is biblical as we read through the way Jesus interacted with people. He was more concerned with telling the truth, even if it hurt, than he was with just being nice. And so, um, so, this is something I really, really do think Christians need to be aware of and mention more. Do you think it's valuable, I mean, to be able to quote the particular passage in the Hadith or in the Quran that bring these particular things up? You know, so when you say to somebody, hey, this is what Muhammad did, it's in Sahih Bukhari, you know, whatever it is, yeah. the, the chapter and verse, do you think that's more helpful, uh, or to have that information would probably be more helpful as well at that time, so that they can look it up for themselves. Um, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. That, yes, I think that's really valuable. It's really important to have to have that information available. I don't think it's critical that I don't think it I don't think it matters at all that you that we be able to quote the the verse word for word for word. Um, uh, Muslims are likely to say that um, that's not the Quran anyway. That's just a, that's some, an English translation, and, and the translation is not the Quran. Uh -huh. But if we have the if we have the citation, we can say, hey, go look up Quran 424 later. Yeah. Go you know go look up 929. Go, um, you know, so that becomes more effective. Not okay. you quoting it, but right. you actually referencing it is mm -hmm. more effective because then they read it with their own. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's yeah, exactly. No, yeah, they'll they'll go back and read it. Um, in oh, and I'm always encouraging my Muslim friends read the Quran, read the Hadith in a language you understand. This is this is you 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 only uh, supposedly the Quran only exists in Arabic and it can't be translated. But only 20% of Muslims speak any form of Arabic, and none of them speak classical Arabic as their natural language. So this is this amounts to nobody <laughs> no being able to understand what the Quran says without just trusting a handful of scholars who have devoted their lives to this. And so I encourage people: you have to read this in a language you understand, uh, and. Um, you know, and, and uh, or go, you know, go to any university and say, can I speak to the Arabic professor here, and and uh, and ask him, what does this say from the Quran? What is? Just tell me what this says. Translate it for me. Um, and uh, you know, find a way to figure out what it actually says. You cannot just take the word of people who have something enormous to gain by you um, just believing whatever they say. So. Yeah, and I do. I, I carry. I um, 
uh, keep access on my phone to a document that has, you know, all a whole bunch of different verses, passages, um, the citations according to uh, categorized by um, topic. So if I'm talking to someone about women or about violence or about Muhammad or about heaven or whatever, I can kind of find that quickly and say, well, you know, this is this is what I've read in the Quran. So. You know, you should check out the, that, this verse. Yeah. And they're fine with me going, oh, I don't remember the citation. One sec, one sec. Yeah, yeah. And then finding it. You know? Yeah. Tell me, how, how you got, how did you get started with women in apologetics? When did that relationship form? Yeah, that was only a couple of years ago. I think, um, yeah, about two and a half years ago. I had been um, ministering in the Muslim community in Atlanta. And then I moved to a rural area where there really weren't very many Muslims, if any. And so those opportunities weren't really there anymore. And I decided through, it's a long story how, but uh, I decided to start writing a blog. And it's at, uh, it's called An Affair With Reason. Um, we, we have seemingly uh, lost the ability to think rationally and, and um, to utilize and understand evidence, um, to know that there is truth and there is falsehood, and to uh, uh, to to be reasonable and to think reasonably. And so, um, I uh, so my kind of my invitation with is come. Let's just have a just have an, a, an appointment with reason. Just try it out. See what it's like to be to think rationally. See what we come up with and see where the truth leads us. And so I, I was publishing uh, two or three articles a week, and I met Rachel Shockey, the, the founder and president of Women in Apologetics, at the uh, WIA conference. I think it was the third annual conference. And we realized that we were both flying back to Tampa from Biola University in California after the conference. And so we uh, decided to have lunch. We had like a two hour lunch. Um, we had so much fun talking. We had so much in common. So after our two hour lunch, um, Rachel said, would you be interested in being interviewed to work with Women in Apologetics? And um, I, you know, I had thought that my experiences with Islam were just kind of one thing, one isolated thing. And they started adding up to a bunch of things. <laughs> um, and, you know, by this point I had like 10 or 15 years of experience in Islam, but I wasn't, this wasn't something I was seeking, like I want to be an Islam ministry specialist or anything, but but when I asked Rachel you know, what she had in mind, she said, well, I'd love to bring you on as our Islam ministry specialist. I'm like, Islam again? Seriously? <laughs> I, I just agreed, you know, I had agreed to train this one team with Engineering Ministries International, um, who I was with years ago, to launch them to the Middle East, so I took a course on Islam, I went to the Middle East, spent time in Egypt and Jordan, uh, started reading the Quran, and then when when we sent out that team, I thought it was over. I'm like, great, let's go back to you know the other areas of theology and training and such that I do discipleship uh, apart from Islam. And then I was asked to go to Afghanistan and minister to women there. And then I was asked to go to Greece and help with the refugee crisis. And then I was asked to minister to Muslims in the refugee community in Atlanta. And then, and then here I was, you know, having lunch with Rachel. Back, She's like, "Do you want to be our Islam ministry specialist?" <laughs> so um, I said, "Yeah." I mean, an, an interview couldn't hurt, and I, if, you know, if nothing else, I get to know another person on staff with with Women in Apologetics, which is a great ministry. I love all areas of apologetics, not just Islam. So I agreed to the interview, and um, as I was checking out their website before that interview, like the day before. I realized, I was looking at their mission and vision and, and what they do and what they want to do, and I was like, I want to do this, I want to do this. So I texted my cousins who are all uh, Christians, and I was like, will you pray for me? I, I have an interview tomorrow that was like no big deal, but I just realized that I actually do want to do this. <laughs> and so they're like, yeah, absolutely. The interview went really well. And, and I joined as the Islam Ministry Specialist, and now I'm serving as the um, Education Department's Managing Editor. So create, we're creating more courses on truth, worldview, um, uh, let's see, critical thinking, um, and we have many more courses, online courses planned for the future. Have you always been so bold 
or was there a time? Because here you are, you know, you were talking with Elizabeth, and you're saying, you know, people are just, you know, they're scared to kind of, you know, do those things. And have you always been that way, where you weren't afraid, uh, maybe didn't have the, you weren't afraid to, to speak your mind or different things like that, or did that come after a, a, a lot of studying in Islam, where you became more comfortable with it, or? later on in life mm -hmm. I'm just curious about that yeah I that has definitely grown in me I was not always that way um, I mean I suppose I think my parents might say they saw little glimpses of um, boldness maybe when I was a kid but I would say overall I was a major um, people pleaser follow like don't challenge anything do what the teacher says I would just Ball. If a teacher gave me a look that implied she was not quite fully happy with me, <laughs> I, was, I just needed to please everybody. And when I went to seminary in my early 20s, um, the professors at Denver Seminary, uh, so a few of them were very adamant that if you are a people pleaser and you need the approval of others, ministry is almost certainly not for you. Um, you you're it's going to be really, really hard. You're probably going to get burned out and quit pretty soon. Mm -hmm. And this is if this is a challenge for you. You really need to pray about whether you should be here and, and what the next steps really should be for you. And I, uh, what I did with that was um, I realized this is important, but I'm not where I need to be, and uh, but I want to get there. And so I set a personal a goal. Um, we had each, each semester we were asked to set a, a goal in the area of character growth and a, a goal in the area of, of competency. And I set uh, my first semester, I believe it was, first or second semester of doing this, I, um, my goal was to, um, uh, to serve an audience of one and you know, only to be bold and to disagree um, respectfully when appropriate, to be willing to share the truth with people who were may not be open to it and just let it go where it goes and um, my one of my first mentors used to always say we share the truth in the power of the Holy Spirit and we leave the results to God and that was something I really wanted to do share the truth in the power of the Holy Spirit but the results are not my um, responsibility I'm not the one who changes hearts um, and so uh, if people decide they don't like me or they disagree with me I need to be okay with that, and uh, under that that goal, you know, of, of not being a people pleaser, I had a whole bunch of different tasks. You know, um, search in the Bible for relevant passages, and I found several, and I memorized them. Uh, interview somebody who is very bold and doesn't concern themselves with what other people think, um, and ask them like, well, how did this happen? <laughs> what do you attribute this to? Um, I read about um, martyrs uh, of the faith who were rejected. So through my reading and lots and lots of prayer time, and I require, I, I set the task to speak to people in my neighborhood who I knew were not going to be open to Christianity, or I thought at least. And um, So uh, you began to take steps. Yes. That seems like, yes. I mean, the other stuff is preparatory, but that seems like you stepping out, you yeah. going to talk to your neighbors. Yeah, exactly. That is an action step. Exactly. So I had to decide, like, do I fulfill what I've just written here for my seminary mm -hmm. course, like, requirements, or, or, or do, you know, and at the risk of people not liking me, or do I... Do I get a bad grade? <laughs> Which, ah, no. <laughs> um, and not speak to people. And I just uh, took this took the step. And actually, a couple of women became Christians wow. and have been on fire for the Lord for the past. That was that was like twenty years ago. They and they they are still walking with the Lord because there, I stepped out in faith. Was there a practical step like, okay, I'm going to talk to one neighbor per week or one neighbor per day? What? Yeah, there was something like, I think it was, um, I think it was, I'm going to talk to, yeah, one person per, per week. And if I, you know, it, I was open to it being in the grocery store or, you know, somewhere else. But, yeah. but the easiest, you know, the, the most obvious, most accessible, if I couldn't find people elsewhere, was, was going to have to be in my neighborhood. Um, and that that's where most of those, those conversations took place. Um, I, I think it's so interesting. I, I don't know if there's an answer for this, but here you are now, and then there you were then. And well, so say 
you're you're not bold before, mm -hmm. you know. Right. Uh, you're a people pleaser, and then you decide to take this action, and mm -hmm. and then maybe what six months later you're doing actions mm -hmm. of someone who is bold. Right. So you're you're in faith, you know. Right. You're you're taking steps of faith, and then at a certain point, you're like. You're just doing it naturally. Right, exactly. It's no longer something you have to do. And so then you're like, well, how did I get here? Right. But it was just because you stepped out in faith mm -hmm. and took action steps. Yeah. Does that sound about right? That definitely sounds right. I remember t many, many times in my, um, I guess I would say, uh, late 20s and, and um, 30s when people would tell me they really admired my boldness and my uh -huh. courage uh -huh. and, and things like that. And I would tell them, I'm, I'm not bold or courageous uh -huh. and they're like well you're acting like you are I'm like okay well, that's a fair statement yeah. I'm yeah. acting like I am uh -huh. um, but I but um, now I you know I'm like well it's fun I can't help it that, that's my response now wow, that's I, I love going up and having these conversations with people and I'll tell you what apologetics was a huge part of that as well um, it uh, in my 20s when I was going up to neighbors I was sharing the gospel but most, for the most part at that time, um, all I had was what is true. I had nothing about why it's true. And so when people would say to me, um, well, I'm glad that works for you. I'd be like, no, that's not what I meant. Yeah. And they're like, well, uh, it doesn't, it's not, that's not going to work for me. And I'd be like, oh, okay. And I had no idea what to say. Yeah, exactly. But as I learned apologetics and, and then, you know, that, that, um, incident I told Elizabeth about with the um, progressive pastor yeah. who um, you know was challenging me and then I you know came to him with the minimal facts yeah. that was a huge boost for it me uh, right. because I yeah. knew um, that made sense and then as from there I started learning about um, the science the scientific evidence for theism yeah. that was huge for me as well yeah. so now I mean I have conversations all the time with athe atheists yeah. who and I look forward to these conversations and yeah. I know they're gonna say because they say to me all the time um, I can never be a Christian because I believe in science yeah. people say this to me all the time that is now probably my favorite thing to hear from people I'm like I'm like I'm I'm a Christian in large part because of the science I have become interested in science That's because a great of response. being Christian and uh, uh, let's talk about science. Yeah. So I have one neighbor um, who uh, is who um, is an atheist, but he that reminds me of our science points to God T-shirts. <laughs> nice. <laughs> That's great. Go ahead, your name. Yeah, I have one neighbor who the first thing he told me was um, that same thing that I've heard from so many atheists. I could never be a Christian because I I study science and I believe science is real. And um, and what a great response. Well, actually. <laughs> I yeah. You say your response. I'm I'm a Christian in part because of the science. Because of the science. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And so we have had so many great conversations. I mean, he told me in one of our first conversations that he thought that believing in Christian uh, in God in your 40s is comparable to believing in flying spaghetti monster. It's sure. ridiculous. Sure. And uh, now he said to me um, about six months ago, I think. After several conversations about um, you know the evidence for the universe having a beginning uh -huh. and the Cologne cosmological argument and things like this, he he thought he thought about our conversations obviously in his quiet time and wow. uh, at home alone uh, because he came back to me one about six months ago and he said he said look you know I have to tell you I've been looking at some of the evidence um, that I study anyway, but thinking about it from the perspective, you know, that we've talked about. And I have to admit, I mean, there is a really good case that could be made for Christianity uh, from the science. Wow. Yeah. From Spaghetti from, Monster. Yes. Yeah. To... There's a, there, you could make a pretty good case. And then check this out. <laughs> a few weeks ago, he told me that Christianity is the best explanation for the scientific evidence. Okay, he next does, step. <laughs> right? 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 Exactly. Wow, that's awesome. Exactly. So, um, so what uh, what would be your go-to uh, resource if somebody said, um, what do you mean uh, science? You know, points to God, mm -hmm. uh, like a book. Like, what's your what, what or or an, or an author? What's your mm -hmm. favorite? Who's your favorite science author? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, well, if they have any sort of science background at all, 
I'm probably going to point him to Stephen Meyer. He's my favorite. My favorite <laughs> He's absolutely excellent. Um, if I know that they haven't taken science since like 10th grade and they hate it and they're totally intimidated by it, um, I might uh, ask them if they if they they would consider um, like some historical evidence um, or uh, for some people you know phil uh, philosophical evidence but or arguments, but um, I. As kind of a, an intro, kind of first book, I like to recommend um, I Don't Have Enough Faith to Be an Atheist by Frank Turek and yeah. Norm Geisler. Yeah, so it just gives such a, a such comprehensive a good overview. Starts from exactly. what it, is there truth? Right, right. Then goes to science, and mm -hmm. okay, I guess maybe there is God, and then Jesus, right. and then the New Testament. Yeah, yeah exactly. That book is great. It's great, yeah. I, we have that, you know, we have like a 50 greatest books in okay. apologetics, yeah. and mm -hmm. that's number two okay. behind tactics. And yes. of course, Tactics is not really an apologetics book in the mm -hmm. sense of it gives you a bunch of information, but it teaches you how to engage exactly. with people, which is so valuable. Yep. And you were talking to Elizabeth earlier about how they were steamrolling you with questions, mm -hmm. you know, and, and, and Greg Kugel talks about that in his book, how we just kind of accept as Christians that I guess we have to answer all the questions, right. but we don't get to just ask them them the question to right. kind of disengage them and just say, well, where did you hear that? Or, you know, how did you come to that conclusion? Which is, which is such a powerful thing to learn. Exactly. I tell, I, I, I also have that in one of my top two. So I'll, yeah, I'll tell people, you know, read this to, to learn about, but mostly for Christians. Yeah. So for Christians, I'll oh, tell yeah. who yeah. want to learn apologetics. Yes. Um, I'll give them, you know, a, uh, um, what, uh, why is Christianity true? And a, how to yes. present it, so and tactics is always the how to present it. Um, yeah. That book has great Coco has has really um, meant a lot to me. I yeah. I think I didn't miss a um, podcast of his for like three straight years when I was getting into apologetics. Are you doing what you uh, you know want want to be doing, or do you see yourself in a certain place in the future? So yeah, I. Um, I would say I absolutely love what I'm doing right now, and I can't think of anything I'd rather be doing. I, awesome. uh, my, my goal is to make the most of every day I have on this earth, um, in this life, and then enjoy celebrating <laughs> and resting and celebrating, and I think we'll work too, but you know, without tiredness and frustration and thorns and thistles and yeah. brokenness and tears and all that on the new earth but um, I want to make the most of every single day here and so when I walk my dog um, I invite the the neighborhood kids in my neighborhood know that they're welcome to come that I walk my dog every day and they're welcome to come and then I'm gonna ask them about spiritual things I'm gonna listen to them too and what's on their mind and encourage them and whatever but I'm gonna help them see everything uh, that's going on in their lives through a biblical worldview um, I uh, have, uh, if I see a neighbor out, you know, and um, have an opportunity to have a conversation, that happens almost every day that I walk my dog. Uh, if I, um, I do CrossFit five days a week, and I see that as as much of a ministry as a workout. And so, um, I usually the the workout's about an hour long, including you know warm up and stretching and everything. I'm usually there about two, two and a half hours because people want to stay after and have conversations about what did you mean when you said such and such? Or, you know, um, yeah, I've heard, you know, I heard you do this or that. Can we talk about that? Or just how, you know, how's your life? I haven't caught up with you in a while. So I end up having conversations with people long after the workout is over. And then, um, and then I, I go home and, and walk my dog and have conversations in the neighborhood. And then, you know, I get to write articles, um, both for my blog and for Women in Apologetics. Um, I get to create online courses through Women in Apologetics. Um, I get to speak at conferences and retreats and, you know, and churches and such. And I just, I want people to know the truth. It has, I, I, I experienced 21 years of life without knowing the Lord. And so that is ingrained in my mind. Um, what that is like to live without purpose, 
that you're aware of, or just, I, I had a purpose, but I had made it up. It was arbitrary. It wasn't going to last beyond my 80 years or so in this, you know, in this life. Um, I, <clears throat> I, I knew, I know what it's like to, to, um, feel like nothing really has any ultimate meaning at all to, um, and not just feel that way, but to know that <laughs> it's reality. If there is no, if there's nothing past this life mm -hmm. and it's, it's depressing, no matter how hard I worked, I achieved, um, so many really, um, challenging goals. I, I, um, uh, really accomplished a lot. And yet as soon as I got the trophy or as soon as I got the grade or whatever, it, I was happy for about 10 seconds, if not just relieved. And then I was, um, and then it felt like just time to go back and start over and work hard and sweat and cry and suffer for, you know, another one of these dumb trophies. And then I met the Lord and it changed absolutely everything. I have meaning and purpose um, and joy and, um, uh, happiness for all eternity to look forward to on the new earth with the Lord and with um, a renewed body without my my own battle with sin with my brothers and sisters in Christ without their uh, battles with sin and um, you know without the enemy uh, attacking us without again the you know the, the struggles of this world and I want everyone to know that hope and that joy and, and that that makes all the, the difference. Jesus makes all the difference in this life and for all eternity. And so I just want to make the most of every moment. Um, sometimes making the most of every moment means taking an hour nap. <laughs> it means being alone for a couple days because I'm, I am an introvert. Um, but um, that is resting and equipping and preparing to, to again, um, do what I can to be a part of um, advancing the kingdom and uh, being a part of what God is doing to draw people to himself. It's, it's just the most incredible privilege and uh, I just I want to have no regrets. That's awesome. Well, um, can you just say again um, just quickly where, where people can go to um, get your Islam course and follow your blog and, and women in apologetics? Yes, yes. So the Islam course is it's called Islam Foundations. It's available at womeninapologetics.com. And we, we also have a free newsletter that comes out monthly with different apologetics uh, arguments, articles in there, as well as our events. And uh, we partner with a lot of other ministries to hold conferences and things like that. So um, you can keep up with WIA there. And you can follow me personally at um, anaffairwithreason.com. Uh, it's also, the I also have the URL, uh, laurazpowell.org. So either way will get you to my site. And I have um, uh, videos in the multimedia section that I've done before with talks that I've given, with podcasts I've been on, and um, and then I have an upcoming uh, talks or events page that tells where I'm going to be in the coming weeks or months. So you can find out all about uh, what's going on with me and what I'm writing there. Awesome. Well, thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you. It's been fun. True, show your baby bump. <laughs>